Hello, it's Scott Manley here. After a crazy Tuesday, I finally got to see SpaceX fly the SM5 Starship test vehicle. Riding on a rocket powered by liquid methane and oxygen, this thing took to the sky looking like a giant silver grain silo. We can see the beautiful Mach diamonds of that Raptor engine there. You can see the thing controlling itself hanging in the air in exactly the same way that bricks don't. And then it begins to descend towards its target pad. It performed a rotation and a translation during this. You can see the interior, the legs are down, there's a bit of fire on the engine which I'll talk about. And it gently descends towards this concrete landing pad. And of course I say gently, obviously that is a vast amount of energy coming out of that rocket. But the whole thing is being controlled automatically and moving with an amazing level of delicacy and precision to allow it to stop on that pad without crushing those legs. Now this is from the official SpaceX video, it wasn't broadcast live but there were rocket fans down there streaming it and I think this is my favourite video from the whole thing, this is Trevor Malman who has a Patreon, he goes and photographs rocket launches and you can back and support his quest for the best rocket pictures but he tracks the whole thing in 4K, we get to see again the amazing Mach diamonds and you also get to see this thing is sitting at an angle. The reason for that is they are firing a single rocket engine which sits off axis from the center. It's designed to have a cluster of three but they only have one on it because it only needs one and if they had more than one it would actually have too much thrust to perform this ascent and then descent. We believe the sea level Raptor has about 200 tonnes of thrust and can throttle down to about 50%. So that puts the mass of this whole stack with the propellant between 100 and 200 tonnes. Again, thanks to Trevor Malman for this and for letting me use this. Uh, I, I like watching the smoke clear here because of course then we get to see the Starship SM5 prototype sitting next to the original Starship Hopper that made its single jump and uh, well, it landed with a little more damage than this one. This is a much more successful flight than the Hopper flight. Many people now believe that the 2019 flight was very close to going wrong in a spectacular way. During the ascent, the rocket engine was a nice blue uh, you know, with Mach diamonds, but as it was coming in, the color of the stream changed and the consensus now is that something was seriously going wrong with that engine and that uh, your bright yellow flame was the result of a phenomena called engine rich exhaust as the engine was destroying itself and it barely landed in time. This time there was no change in the colour of the engine flame. This engine worked all the way through this thing perfectly. Well wait, what about that fire on the side of the Raptor? That doesn't look normal. I'll be honest, I thought this initially might be a leak in the you know high pressure fuel side of things but if it is, it's very, very small and it doesn't develop. In fact, by the time it lands, this appears to have been extinguished. So I think this is likely to be something that's just on the outside of the engine, possibly something that was used to clean it, possibly lubricants or hydraulic fluid. I don't know, but it doesn't, it looks that it disappears when they come in for the landing. If you look, yeah, it's not there anymore. Now, that could just be because the engine firing the en you know, rocket plume at the ground is so much brighter that the exposure in the camera doesn't catch the flame anymore, but I, I don't know, I find that... I'm not sure about that. I, I think this is just something that's exterior to the engine. I don't think it was a huge threat to the engine. After all, anything on the outside of that engine is going to be designed to handle fairly high temperatures fairly harsh thermal environments. And we know that this is Raptor serial number 27 thanks to Boca Chica Gal, of course, who's working with nasaspaceflight.com. This was delivered in early July, and of course we get great photos from all the, the fans that are down there taking pictures. Uh, if you're really interested in the Raptor engine and like reverse engineering it, there is a fantastic thread at the nasaspaceflight.com forums. Just taking apart these and looking at the different uh, changes from one model to the next. Obviously, they're now pushing out these engines every couple of weeks, but they're a long way from being able to put enough engines on a spacecraft to actually you know, build a super hot heavy. 
I've certainly enjoyed dropping by the NASA space flight stream. So yeah, this is, um, again, from their YouTube channel here, you can really see the way it takes off. It does this sort of power slide sideways. Obviously, it has to sit vertically on top of the pad early on. And because the engine's offset, it will have to you know, do this power slide. They prefer not to do it, but they're pretty much committed to having to do that. It's also fascinating to watch the ground service equipment disconnect during the launch. Watch that pipe there on the right side of the vehicle. There, you'll see that it lets out a burp of methane as it detaches and it just bursts into flame for a few seconds. If you remember, the massive blast on serial number four was caused by ground service equipment leaking liquid oxygen and methane. Most people believed the SN4 would be the first one to hop, but then they had this absolutely catastrophic accident involving the quick disconnects, well, not disconnecting in the right way. There might have been a similar problem here, but I think that uh, doesn't matter the thing I ended up flying. It may have taken several iterations, but with every iteration, they did make improvements that ultimately uh, were, were a step forward. I mean, if you look at the original SN1, it's very clear that it was patched together panels of stainless steel. Now you have these continuous rings, you have much cleaner welds, the structural loads are being transmitted in a more proper fashion. At the same time, it's still very much a flying grain silo. They've put the uh, you know pressure vessels on the side the, for the nitrogen, you've got reaction control thrusters, you've got sensors so that they can actually fly it. But I'll tell you what, when it landed, it did look like it was a little off at an angle there. And since I'm pretty sure they put the landing pad down flat, it might be that they you know, hit the ground a little hard. It's not clear, but they certainly didn't hit it hard enough to knock stuff off. And you know, we've obviously saw that happen with uh, Hopper. And let's be clear, on this image, the engine is on the left side of the vehicle, so therefore it would have been tilted towards the left to keep the center of mass above that engine. And then when it landed, it had to rotate clockwise a little to put all its legs on the ground, and that would no doubt lead to extra stress on those uh, legs on the right. And you know, if you think about it, that mass simulator is on the front because it moves the center of mass upwards and it reduces the angle the vehicle has to maintain and therefore it reduces the rotation rates when the vehicle lands. So it's actually probably critical to making sure it doesn't fall over by rotating into the vertical position. And when they start adding the nose cones, they won't need this because that will move more mass up the front. And if you've been looking at some of the photos coming out, there's a lot of nose cones they've been building. In fact, I think they have more nose cones than they will ever need because a big part of this is just figuring out how to correctly build those nose cones. <laughs> like they're a little harder, I guess, because they're curving in two dimensions. But the nose cones now have reaction control thruster ports built into them. So whenever they start flying those, they're obviously looking at the aerodynamic tests that are or the requirements requirements for the 20 kilometer test flight. I don't think that's what will happen for serial number five or six, to be honest. I think that's probably going to be serial number eight. They are building out this process. They've been evolving their design. And it's amazing the difference between the early Mark I and the current one. The lines are cleaner. The welds are better. Everything looks stronger. And of course, every single one of these has been an experiment towards building their perfect Starship. A big transition is about to happen. They're switching from 301 stainless steel to 304L. And I think the reason behind the change is that 304 isn't quite as strong, but it's more ductile, so it's more likely to bend rather than break, which is obviously a desirable thing when you're working in the structure, which is going to bend under loads. But SN5 is where it is right now. And as I speak, thanks to La Padre's live stream, I can see that it is still there, sitting out there, unattended. It sat the whole night because, of course, it's full of rocket propellant. They had to make sure it had extra propellant so it didn't run out of fuel. But that meant that it's a pressurized tank and nobody wants to go close to that thing. So they have to wait for some of that stuff to boil off. They really don't have a way to detank this after it's moved to the landing pad because they need the connectors to the ground service equipment. Obviously, this is something they're going to improve at some point, but for now, it's a very long wait. We will probably see more flights by SN5, but I think they might, unless it's a failure, they might skip over SN6, and SN7 was a test tank, so SN8 is the one that people are really looking towards to actually perform big aerodynamic flights. It looks like it has all the components and it has the new 
stainless steel uh, alloy. And I hope that means that it flies before the end of the year. I'm hoping in the next couple of months we will have another update from Elon on the progress, talking about the successes and the failures. And I'm going to be clear, while I expect this is going to be the first of many successful flights, I also don't think we've seen the end of failures and indeed possible catastrophic failures. This is still a very much an experimental program that is pushing very hard and trying to expedite things in, in a way which you know, gets the job done faster, but it is inevitably going to end up having problems which will no doubt lead to me getting on my dressing gown and talking about more explodey stuff. But right now we can feel pretty good about this one small hop for Starship Kind. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.